Hey guys, stick around because today we have Michael Lombardi. He's the star of the new movie, Retaliators. You know him from Rescue Me and lots of other stuff. And he's here to talk today about the new movie, the true story that inspired the idea for the movie, plus working with Dennis Leary and his future projects coming right up. Before we get to the interview, if you could, real quick, make sure to like and subscribe to this video if you're watching on YouTube. That will help get the word out about this interview and helps promote my channel and the movie. Thank you so much. Just watched your movie last night, actually. Thankfully. Did you? I, what did you think? No, I loved it. It's right up my alley. Uh, with even with uh, down to the music and the cameos and stuff. Like I love '80s horror. Uh, the throwbacks. I, I totally got it. it. It made sense to me. Oh, I'm so happy. Yeah, you know, it, it's not for everyone, but to me, no good movie is. You know what I mean? Like it's it's definitely you have to get it. Uh, all those little winks at the '80s, the throwback feel, like you said, the little Easter eggs in there, and it jumps genres and all that kind of stuff. But it's cool that you 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 went on a trip with it. Cool, man. Yeah, I, I love and I, like I, it was fun to just count the cameos and like you know uh, what's his name Brian a uh, whole how do you say it? the guy from Clerks? Oh, Halloran. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was cool. I was like, oh, that's the guy from Clerks. I was like, well, that's like an <laughs> awesome cameo. And then I think I saw. I didn't even see this listed on the credits, but I thought I saw Doc Coyle from Bad Wolves at like the therapy meeting or whatever. Yes, bro. Yes. Yeah. Because I was like, that guy, was, he, that guy did my show, but he didn't have any lines. He was kind of like an extra. Yeah, he had a couple lines, but you know, oh, man, he? but he had a good look to him. I thought he still yeah. had a performance under his eyes, which was huge. Yeah. And then Tommy Lee plays a strip club DJ. How does he, how does he prepare for that role? I wonder. Right? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's funny. Part of what we were trying to do was cast each musician in their cameo so it was seamless as well. Like I, we wanted to make it a film first because to me, if you go, if you see a movie and there's eight rock stars in it or musicians, you're kind of like, oh man, I think for me, it could be hard to take seriously, right? Mm -hmm. um, and be well-respected as a film in the genre However, I think actors, uh, uh, musicians can make wonderful actors because they're storytellers. But that being said, we put a lot of thought into casting each person and wanted to make sure they were comfortable with it. And obviously, Tommy Lee being the uh, DJ in the strip club, you should hear him talk about it. It's pretty funny. Not a big stretch. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I just saw them on the stadium tour and he gets out there and, and uh, now he just announced he has an OnlyFans. Like, that guy's hilarious. Yeah, yeah, totally. <laughs> yeah. It reminds me of like the cameo though. Like, did you use I'm sure you saw Jerry Maguire. Do you remember like Jerry Cantrell's cameo in that movie? Yeah. Like he just had like one line, but he killed it. He's like, that's how you get great, man. You put your balls out there. And he's just like this guy in the coffee shop. And I don't even know if I put two and two together until later. And then I was like, wait, that's the guy from Allison Chains. Like, and, it, and he killed it. It's it like, so I get what you're saying. Like you cast them in the right role. It totally fits. And cause I don't know watching i'm like i think this is a guy from a band but i don't know every band but i couldn't tell who was a rock musician and who was an actor well thanks man then then uh, th literally my job and my goal and sort of my dream when i got the project and having access to these all these incredible musicians and then of course this built-in core audience right in this amazing music because i think the film gives a great wink to those great films of the 80s and 90s like the lost boys the crow judgment night so that musical aspect just jumped off the page from the beginning but to have access to them through better noise uh alan kovac the ceo and founder of better noise music that represents motley crew five finger death punch ice nine kills papa roach on and on he had the he had meatloaf and the bgs in the day he's got debbie harry now so anyway to have access to them and in a way where we're not like independent filmmakers paying tommy lee like half of our budget to get him for the mm -hmm. day it's yeah. like Alan calls him and goes look you know i want you to be part of this film that i'm doing and the goal was for it to be a symbiotic relationship. And what I mean by that is for film lovers and people of this genre to go and see the movie, go on a crazy journey with the movie and enjoy the music and then look it up afterward, precisely like you were saying, and be like, wait a minute, the bad guy, Quinn Brady, 
Jacoby Shaddix. He's the lead singer of Papa Roach. But I think he's so good in the part that you might think he's an actor. And of course, like the five finger guys who play the motorcycle gang, they're all these burly tattooed guys with dreaded beards. I mean, you couldn't you couldn't cast better, I think, if you if you if you ask me. But then we have this access to this incredible built in core audience for the film who likes this genre, but then bringing new uh, viewers and audience members to the music, which I think really, obviously, there's a lot of it in the film. But point is, I didn't want any of it to be too gratuitous, you know, and uh, there is a lot of music. But I think the important thing is that it supports the scene well and the actors and the objectives and sort of the ride that the audience should be taking emotionally. Yeah, it's just fun. You know, it doesn't it doesn't I don't think it takes itself too seriously, like some like down to the some of the gore and stuff. Like, I don't want to spoil it, but like some of the gory yeah. stuff, I'm just like, oh, that was cool. Like that. And that's like, did you ever see that movie uh, Dead Alive in the 80s? I think it's called Brain Dead in Europe, but it's like it's it's Peter Jackson, you know, the guy that did Lord of the Rings. It's like the zombie movie. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, obviously it has that evil dead feel, too. Yeah, a little one. bit. It's not like over the top like those ones. But yeah, there's a little yeah. bit of that. Well, what I love, thanks, is is that uh, you have this great story, and that's what attracted me first. And it's crazy, like the acting, it's a slow burn, too, between mm -hmm. the detective and the pastor and this story and this uh, the fundamental, like, I think, core foundation of the film is this provocative question. If you had a minute alone with the person who hurt or killed your loved one, would you take it? And I think it's about you know, revenge, which is the oldest story in the book, right? It's that primal, uh, primal instinct of, of uh, it's, you know, like a, 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 a saber tooth tiger attacks a caveman's kids. The clan goes and hunts the saber tooth tiger, right? It's been a lot, it's been around since the beginning of time, but I like that in this story, it's through like the man of a cloth, the, of the cloth and, and uh, the religious aspects. So that's what really drew me in. But then it doesn't take itself too seriously. Like you said, the third act gets crazy in this, you know, Tarantino-ish yeah. kind of way. And some of it's over the top, but it's, uh, I love that, that sort of balance. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's perfect. So yeah, explain the story because it's kind of interesting um, you know, the screenwriters, you wrote music with them, but then also there's a rescue me uh, tie in because the film was inspired by a true story based on their sister. Who's now a female firefighter. Dude, this is crazy. Okay. So get this. It's so serendipitous and it's a tremendous story and horrifying. So um, I'm going to take you through the details. Okay. So basically when they were uh so the, the Gear brothers wrote the story and their little sister, Jody, they said when they were kids growing up, you know, she was the kind of kid, they were 12, she was eight years old, always a tough kid. Like if you started a fight with her, she'd hold on to your leg and keep fighting. She was just this spirited young girl. So cut to uh, about uh, maybe around 18 years ago now, she's 18 years old and she's walking home from a party in Northern California. And uh, it was just her and her girlfriends and they were all walking to another house and she took her own route. She lived there. So she knew it and she sort of went by the freeway. So she's walking and uh, she said she, it's about midnight and she felt like a jogger coming up behind her. And she's like, wait a minute, this is a weird time to be jogging, you know? And all of a sudden tackled down the side of a ravine, the guy ran up behind her tackled, And she said, the way she explains it, it's a it's it's so surreal and unbelievable. Like in that moment, it's like looking out your window right now and seeing a dragon, like that this was happening to her. She gets tackled down this ravine. The guy beats her, beats her. She's fighting in her spirit. Doesn't she's fighting and fighting and he's like pulverizing her and he puts a belt around her neck and starts to strangle her. And she goes out, brutal attack, rape. She starts to come to and she hears him walking away and uh, she, you know, she, she takes the belt off and she climbs up the ravine and she said that she ran into the middle of the freeway. So, so cars can see her coming from both ways. She's like barely dressed. She gets in the car. She goes to the hospital. She does the rape kit, the whole thing. And she's very outspoken about this now. And she wants her story told. And she did then. Mm -hmm. um, so she said that when she went into the bathroom to do the rape kit and she looked in the mirror and she saw her face 
And it was the first time she saw how she couldn't even recognize herself. She was so beaten. And she had to call her, uh, she called her mom to tell her what was going on. And she said, don't tell dad, <laughs> you know, like that's, and now of course <laughs> her dad's going to know and, and come, but um, this is how she felt in the moment and to hear her say it will give you, you know, goosebumps. And, and anyway, so does the rape kit. So several years go by, they never catch the guy. Okay. And she's dealing with a lot, of course, and their family is. So cut to about five years ago. This is approximately 12 years after this happened. Oh my God. There's a woman in a taxi cab in Northern California. And the guy pulls to this desolate area and tries to rape the woman. She escapes, brings the cops back to the area. They scour this area and they find a used condom. They take it, do a test on it. It matches Jody Gears from 12 years earlier. So they get the guy, right? DNA match. Now, they're their families going through these tri- it's all brought up again of course and they have, there's a lot of kids in the family brothers and sisters so now their dad has to go through this all like every day of trial and of course Jody and there was one guy on the jury who didn't go for the belt around the neck being uh you know attempted murder so there's a certain amount of sentence you'd get with that without that anyway they ended up getting the guy for full he's a put away for basically life at the end of all this and uh but during this trial the crazy thing was they the one brother in trying to there's so many crazy things so this isn't the crazy thing but this is what they came up with in trying to a way to heal they started writing the retaliators and they said, Hmm. if there were the one brother said to the other, Darren, to his brother, Jeff, he said, you know, what if there were a service where we could, they could get this guy and we could have a minute alone with him. And they started as a creative outlet writing the retaliators. So the film is not about her brutal attack and rape, but it's about this concept Mm -hmm. very religious too in their family. And, you know, um, But here's the other, the crazy serendipitous part is that when this happened to her, when she was 18 years old, she was in firefighter school. So she became a probie after that. I was on a television show called Rescue Me, post 9-11 New York City firefighters um, uh, on the FX network with Dennis Leary. And I played the probie firefighter on that show. And Rescue Me became her favorite television show and me, her favorite character, because I was the rookie and show, so was she at the time. And she talks about all this. You should have her on or I wish she was on with me. Cause it's uh, you know, I'm telling her story, but mm-hmm. uh, pretty well from, you know, my experience with her and then having the responsibility of playing this part. But anyway, um, so she was, it was her favorite show because rescue me was a very, uh, the guys were portrayed as real people with flaws, mm-hmm. problems, even though they were firefighters at the end of the day and running into burning buildings when people were running out and they're heroes, it showed like the old chief had a gambling problem and, he's yeah. in, you know, and he's in an apartment and he got a pan falls over like an old woman in money. It was where she hit her money and he takes it right in the moment. He ends up returning it. But yeah. The being is human issues human uh bad instincts things that you shouldn't do things that people do and regret all the firefighters in my show was so well written in that respect that it had all these elements and and some of the firefighters had ptsd so her dealing with this real life situation and feeling all these emotions and things she was for years after she loved rescue me because she said, Oh my God, you know, I'm a firefighter. The things have happened to these characters. And she knew it was a TV show, but it, that was one of the goals of Dennis Leary who produced this and starred and they created it was to make it as real as possible. So to put these guys, as I said, shine a real light on their humanity. Anyway, it was one of her favorite shows and it also had a lot of comedy. So she'd laugh. And then here I am be the lead in the film that's inspired by her story. And now get this, 
she is one of the few female firefighter captains in America. She's wow. become a captain. So it's a it's a it's a superhero story at the end of the day. That's yeah, that's amazing. I didn't know all the details of, the, of that. That's crazy. Isn't it crazy, man? And you know, I'm sorry for the long. It's just it's a it's 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 a long story, but it's so interesting. To yeah. Me. Well, I She's think that's part. Fighter. Yeah, and then like when you're talking about the trial and how one of the guys didn't believe it or whatever, and that reminded me of the part in the movie where uh, one of the perpetrators gets out after six years for caging, torturing, and raping victims. And so I, I thought, is this is kind of a shot at the justice system right now? Because I feel like our justice system, I mean, I feel like probably it's still one of the best in the world, but there's definitely still a lot of flaws too. So you're kind of calling that out in the movie. Yeah, exactly. The flaws like the religion, morality, justice, all these issues. And to get back to what we were saying is what attracted me about the script without even knowing the origin of the script was the story. But then Again, like you said earlier, there's times it doesn't take itself too seriously. It's at the end of the day, it's a fun popcorn film, right? And it's a crazy mm -hmm. roller coaster ride, but it's the kind of movie where maybe if we're lucky, you can go out afterward, have a drink or dinner and talk about it a little bit, you know, the issues that it does raise. Yeah, the revenge. I mean, because who probably hasn't at least had that thought about getting somebody alone and, and having that moment with, you know, a perpetrator like that for sure. Yeah, and I think that's like the thing, like if you're watching the film, half the people are like, yeah, get them, yeah, and maybe the other half are on the fence with it, but is it right or wrong? Could you really hurt somebody if you were in front of them? You know, like it's kind of crazy if you really could like draw blood or poke their eye out or whatever, even though they're horrible and they did this. It's another right. thing watching it from your seat, but then being in that moment. Yeah, because some people just, they want justice. They want the guy to go to jail. They don't want it. They, they can't hurt another person. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, and it's, especially in the moment. You don't know when, I don't want to spoil it, what happens with this one. Like, can the guy do it? Can he not? It's like, it's kind of like, you, you got to watch the movie to find out. Yeah, you do. And I think you'll go on a heck of a ride and it's unexpected too, which, you know, like I said earlier, the movie's not for everybody, but I think what you will is be shocked, surprised, and uh, it has some crazy twists and turns. And, and again, at the end of the day, it being a revenge tale, I don't think there's been one quite like this. And again, I'm, ta I'm proud of the film because you want to know why? Because I, it's one thing to read a script and fall in love with it and then try to get that script on the screen. There's a lot of whether it's egos, whether it's pivoting uh, because you couldn't get a location, you know, the crew was phenomenal, but fighting COVID during this and having so being shut down through the Screen Actors Guild because there was so much concern, rightfully so, of course, but like someone who wasn't on set got COVID, but we got shut down just to, mm. you know, for, for concerns. But again, um, dealing with all those things, I think the things that I loved about the script now that the movie's out there, I'm hearing people talk about a little bit and I'm going, wow, that was one of the things that I fought for from the beginning. So that's cool, you know, and and, and again, you know, not everyone's going to like it, but I don't really want to make a movie that everyone's going to like. I want to make a script that I like and that I believe in because it's all about passion and work. Mm -hmm. And if you don't have that, you're never going to never do it you know i mean you have to like it has to be like the only thing you can do at the time that's how much you have to love it to try to bring it across the finish line at the end of the day you know for sure so when you're working with guys like dennis leary and alan kovac i mean these guys are at the top of their game what do you learn from them because dennis leary i think he he does more than just act right didn't he produce the rescue me too or kind of i mean he's he did a lot of things with that show so you must learn from what and you walk, worked with dennis leary and other stuff too right yeah. And you know what, man? Um, I did like I did this little guest star in a show, the job he had on ABC. And it was with Karen Parsons, the Fresh Prince of Bel Air. Like I was a guest star. And she was in the show. It was a, it was a funny a little episode. I was a guest star. And then, I, you know, I met him. Uh, we became friends. Uh, he's a huge ice hockey uh, fan and player, and 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 I am too. And then I, about a year later, I did a show on Comedy Central with him. It was a spoof on Project Greenlight. Remember that Ben Affleck, Matt mm -hmm. Damon, 
think it was a spoof on that. It was really funny. It was called Contest Searchlight, and it was on uh, 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 Comedy Central at the time. And um, so I did that. And then a year later, I read for Rescue Me. So it was a long, and then Rescue Me, I was on for 100 episodes, actually, uh, you know, like 98, but then we did many. So so anyway, about 100 episodes. It was a long, uh, a long run uh, as a series regular. But, um, you know, I learned so many things from the guy because, as you said, he made his own path. He produced, he starred, he co-created because you wait around for your agents and managers and we Mm. all need them. But you don't you have to go. You have to go after it and you use them to then negotiate the deals that you're bringing in or the work that you're bringing in. Um, So. You know, his work ethic is tremendous. He's from, uh, you know, Worcester, Mass. His dad was a mechanic. Like, he, he's just a, a real guy. And his work ethic was tremendous. And I think his, number one, it's all about the work and all the rest of the stuff comes. But also his, uh, he can run a crew. You know, not everybody is your friend. Work is work. Mm. And you have to obviously treat everyone with respect and admiration and, and, you know, uh, uh, for doing their job, but the job needs to be done. So I think when I was put in this situation of being, we had a 50 person crew and being in charge and leading the way, being uh, truthful and upfront with people, if you're not happy about a creative decision and always listening and learning, I don't know, I could always learn. I don't think I've had a problem personally with those aspects, but I think of knowing what I want and then being able to run through walls for exactly that, no matter who gets in my way, might have been a challenge for me in the past. But I guess all these years of now experience, I was finally able to do that, I guess, on this film, hopefully. And so, but that is an important thing that I see in Alan and Dennis as mm-hmm. leaders, as people who believe in their vision. As Alan is a CEO, he's leading a major company. And when I talked about the work, getting a no is when the work starts. You know, you have to turn that no into a yes. And that means figuring out what you need to do to, to get it. And again, all about the work and the rest comes like me being on this podcast with you is amazing right thank you for having me and it's a privilege but that's after three years of work from this thing you know Mm -hmm. and i can now i'm going man i hope i can get another one i hope i get to produce and i have several other scripts i love i I, if i'm lucky enough to act in it produce it co-direct it whatever that's where my mind is now and we're still bringing this thing to digital and streaming so it's not even done but the work ethic and being a leader, um, I think it. Some some guys like those guys might have been born with it and and had it a lot earlier than I've learned it. But it's certainly mm. you can learn, you know. Yeah, no, that's awesome. I love when you hear a no. That's when the work starts. That's that's a good one. I'll have to remember that. Yeah, now, you guys already have a sequel that's already planned. It sounds like the second one's kind of almost written. <laughs> well, you know, the the Gear Brothers had so much fun, like through this process. And as I told you, I started with therapy. They were able to outline a lot mm-hmm. like, through this and through this concept. So they have, yeah, they have uh, a whole, this can go on for a while. They've mm-hmm. got a lot. Right okay. Now. If the thing's well-received and people enjoy the ride, we've got more in store as well as some other films as well. Oh, okay. Very cool. And then, yeah, I know you also have some other movies coming out. The Plan B romantic comedy with uh, Tom Berenger and John uh, Heater from Napoleon Dynamite, basically. Yeah, brother. It was so fun. It was funny because after doing this one, which was so intense, exhausting, like, you know, I don't, you, I didn't sleep for a long time because, as I said, at the end of the day, when you're playing this character is going through all the stuff and all the stunts. And you get home, you're in the shower or back at the hotel for an hour, getting the blood off. Then it's about putting the, the, the fake blood. There's a lot of fake sticky blood in this movie too. So dealing with that, then you're, then you're putting out fires and doing stuff for the next day. So anyway, after all that it was so fun to jump on that film plan B because it's all like, it's a romantic comedy and it was just so ridiculous and fun improv with the actors and it's light. And uh, Tom Berenger's the man, he played my dad in it. And uh, 
that guy's got some stories, man. Holy cow. Oh. He's done like 86 or 89 feature films. I mean, with oh, yeah. own John Platoon, Newton. Major League. Like, oh, he's Dude, some I'm of my favorites. Cool. Yeah, he's something. So that was yeah. really cool. And then are you doing a movie with, did you do a movie with Nicolas Cage called The Old Way? No, but you know, I did do a movie with Clive. I'd love to do something with Nick Cage. That guy's sick. Did you see Mandy, by the way? Which one is that? Is that the new? It's a horror, but it's in the vein of like the style. Like he's yeah. blood. It has like retaliation. Okay. It's a great like art. I saw art. that the one in the one where he plays himself. That was really fun. Dude, I haven't seen that yet, but oh, I can't. it's really good. He's great, man. You gotta love Nick Cage. But what uh uh the movie, what were we just talking about before that? The uh Plan the, B? No, Plan B. Tom Berenger? Top mm, Retaliators? Said, no, you said were you in Were you there was some movie called The Old Way that I thought it said you had you listed as you uh, or as a credit with Nicolas Cage. The old way. Yeah, I don't know. Man, I'll take it. Maybe it's like, well, did you ever get confused with the other Michael Lombardi, like the NFL guy? Yes. Because <laughs> when I was trying to find interviews with you, I kept I kept finding his name and I couldn't find your interviews. I had to scroll like through stuff. It was weird. Yeah, dude, because it's, he's got to be related to Vince Lombardi to get that so much pull. You know, that's it has to be like. I never thought of that. Probably. It is. Um, you know what I was going to tell you, though? That's what it is. I did a movie. This is another great homie oh with a. Uh, Clive Owen and Morgan Freeman in last nights where I was in Prague for over like four months. It's, it's like, it's a fun movie. It's like nights of no specific age, like, a, or, or time period. It's really crazy gear, costumes and wardrobe and it's castles all throughout Czechoslovakia. And there's another guy, man, I can put him in a category speaking of Clive of like a dentist or an owl. I'm like, that guy's about the work, the projects he picks. Like, you know, if you're at the bar grabbing a couple pops with him after a day of shooting, he sits with the stunt men. You know what I mean? Like, he's like, hmm. he's the guy, he's a guy's guy. He's a phenomenal actor and, uh, you know, hell of a guy. I This film, um, like I said, it's about like, Morgan Freeman flew in and filmed like two days on it. And he did like a four page monologue coming from another movie. He's got like a photographic memory. So it was like, came in and he was so amazing to watch in it um, live because he's Morgan Freeman, you know, he doesn't. Yeah. Even, yeah he Does doesn't he talk like that for everything? Does he do the Morgan Freeman voice? Like when he's having lunch and just like, you know, like I'll take a pepperoni and a sandwich or like, I mean, just, it's gotta be surreal to hear that voice just doing normal everyday things. It was. It was. I just watched him. I watched him and then I watched the monitor. I was just watching both. And like, he didn't even move. He was just like, just so grounded. And he delivers the speech to Clive. And then, uh, and you know, like it, the film, Morgan Freeman's like the emperor. Clive's like his right hand man. And then there's thousands of nights, but it's about Clive's group of like five. And I'm one of them. Another sick actor. I, when I think of this film, I have to bring up Cliff Curtis is his name. This guy He's like a chameleon. He's from New Zealand. And uh, did you see um, uh, Ethan Hawke uh, uh, um, with, uh, oh, Jesus, and I'm getting old, man. Forgive me. Um, I can't remember the movie. But he, this guy. The new one or is it an old one? An old one. He played Pablo Escobar in the movie. Oh. Uh, he was um, the, the Ethan Hawke one. Like, it's the two cops, man. Um, oh, uh, Training Day? Training no. day. So no, you know the guy in that movie, yes, uh, the guy who puts Ethan Hawke in the bathtub, and he's about yeah. to kill him, the gang guy, and then he takes, he sees, he finds the 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 daughter's, uh, his little sister's number. That's Cliff Curtis, the gang. He oh. like a, he played Pablo Escobar in Blow. He played that gang guy. He's a he's an avatar. Okay. He's an amazing actor. So uh, the point that I guess I'm getting at is. Um, you just learn so much from the different yeah. people you work with, you know, man, like their work ethic, their, their acting chops, what they bring, what they layer into their characters before they come, who they are. And all this just, I guess, makes you who you are at the end of the day. And if you're lucky enough to have that kind of career, or be around those people when you're young, I guess you get it a lot earlier, but not only do you have to be lucky enough to be around them, but I guess, uh, uh, um, th there and and open enough to be able to take them in as well and learn mm -hmm. that yeah stuff. 
and have the desire to do it, to, 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 to make a movie, to, to have a really good acting job and all those kinds of things. Cause some people might be in the business, but take it for granted or not work as hard and yeah, or in it for different reasons, you know, yeah. and just to, so yes, yes. Yeah. Very cool. Well, I'll let you get going. I know you got probably a million interviews. Um, I always end each episode with a charity though. Is there a charity you want to give a shout out to her at the end? Yeah, thank you so much. I would actually, and that would be the Leary Firefighter Foundation. And uh, so Dennis Leary started this after in Worcester, there was a terrible uh, uh, warehouse fire where six firefighters died. Mm. And that was the biggest loss up to date. And it's, it's called the W6. It happened in Worcester, Massachusetts. So he started the Leary Firefighter Foundation, which since then, uh, obviously, 9-11 really shined a light on everything, of course, and 343 firefighters died in 9-11, and Dennis's yeah. charity not only is given to the families, he was, I think, the second charity of all charities at in that year of 9-11 to actually hand a million dollars out to widows and families, wow. and, so, and he's done so much. It's a uh, it's an incredible charity. There's some amazing people on the board. And what he does since then, it's been forever now. But like I said, he started it before 9-11. And uh, so he'll provide ropes and tools and supplies for firefighters to go and do their job properly, not only to save people, but to keep themselves safe as well. Oh, that's really cool. Yeah, it's funny. I never I'd heard of Rescue Me. And I never watched it. But then last night um, before I got your movie, I was like, well, I can't find the movie. I'll watch Rescue Me. And I just watched the pilot and I was like, oh, this is awesome. This is right <laughs> up my alley. So now I'm hooked. I got to watch all 100 episodes or whatever. So cool, dude. Awesome it's a that. crazy show, man. I yeah. don't think it could ever um, be made today. It's very racist. Yeah, crazy. that's true. Because it's firefighters, a bunch of dudes in a firehouse and girls. Yeah, it's and like girls. manly men. I, I, There's not a lot of shows like that. So it's right up my alley. I love it. Thank you so much. I uh, love the movie too. And uh, hopefully it gets a good reception. Thank you so much for your time and having me and your thoughtful questions, man. I appreciate it. All right. Have a good one, Michael. See you later. See you, brother. Be good. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Okay. I don't know what a pepperoni sandwich is, so I'm not sure what I was talking about there, uh, but I think you get the gist. That was a fun interview with Michael. Thanks again to him and his PR team. Make sure to check out the Retaliators movie. It's on the move right now to different cities, and uh, it'll eventually be on streaming too. And you can follow both Michael and the Retaliators movie on social media along with myself and the podcast, if you're so inclined. I appreciate all your support with likes, comments, and shares. It really means a lot to me, and I'm eternally grateful for that. Uh, the guests appreciate it, too, because it helped promote their stuff as well. So have a great rest of your day, and remember to shoot for the moon. Shoot for the moon.